High Speed Rail coming to Las Vegas, a dozen new heritage units, a new Amtrak route, and a train on the moon? All coming up now on Railroad Quarterly, my tri-monthly recap of North American Railroad news. Today's episode begins back in March of 2024 and runs through the end of May, so without further ado, let's begin. Beginning back in March, Higher Speed Rail Company Brightline announced two new stations along its Orlando to Miami, Florida corridor in Stewart and Cocoa. The railroad says these stations will open in mid to late 2026. A few days later, the French Lick Scenic Railway acquired multiple bi-level diesel multiple unit trains built by the now defunct Colorado Railcar Company. These cars were at one point considered the future of North American commuter rail, but unfortunately never caught on. On the 13th, CSX released ES44AC number 1972 in a family line system heritage paint scheme. Speaking of heritage units, the next day, Philadelphia's SEPTA painted a Kawasaki light rail vehicle into its original paint scheme. As far as I know, this is one of the only times that a light rail vehicle has become a heritage unit. On the 19th, for some reason, Northrop Grumman announced that it would begin to develop a lunar railroad to move freight and passengers on the moon. Shouldn't we be focusing on our railroads here on Earth before expanding to another planet? Anyway, I'm not exactly sure what the point of this is, but these AI renderings look somewhat interesting. The next day, mock-ups of the Washington Metro's new 8000 series cars were shown to the public. These new cars will be built at the new Hitachi Rail Plant in Hagerstown, Maryland, and will enter service in 2027. On the 21st, Siemens Mobility completed its first dual-mode charger locomotives for Metro North. The first two units soon departed the factory for safety testing in Pueblo, Colorado. It's expected that the next batch of Metro North chargers, classified as SC42DMs, will be completed soon and will travel to New York. In other next-gen equipment news, on the same day, New Jersey Transit posted photos and later videos of its new Alstom Odessia bi-level multiple units that will be delivered later this year. This order was placed in late 2018, and after some considerable delays, seemed to finally be on the way. Keeping the new equipment news going, two days later on the 23rd, in response to strong ridership numbers, Brightline placed an order for 20 additional venture cars built by Siemens Mobility. These cars will be used to expand trains from 4 cars to 6 cars by 2025, with plans to eventually go up to 10 cars per train. On March 27th, New York City approved a first-of-its-kind law known as congestion pricing, which implements a toll on all drivers in Manhattan. The goal of this law is to reduce traffic in the city and to incentivize the use of transit. All revenue generated by this new regulation will go into transit projects in the region. Though it's still awaiting final approval, it's likely that it will go into effect in the near future. Like it or not, other cities, particularly those on the East Coast, will most likely implement similar laws in the near future. The next day, Boston, a city that I could totally see creating a congestion tax, reworked its contract with CRRC to finish building subway cars for its red and orange lines. These changes increased the overall price of rail cars and also forgave millions of dollars in late delivery fees. When CRRC originally won the contract to build these cars, they were the cheapest option for the MBTA, but after this revised contract, it's likely that it'll be more expensive after all. Staying in Boston, on April 21st, Amtrak Heritage NPCU number 90406 returned to service after being stored in Albany for years. Unfortunately, the Phase 3 F40 didn't last long as it was shortly removed from the Downeaster and held for servicing in Boston. The next day, after years of debate and countless rail company lobbies pushing against it, the Federal Railroad Administration mandated two-person crews on trains. In recent years, countless freight railroads have been trying to switch to one-man operations in order to cut costs, but on the 2nd of April, the FRA ruled against this practice in the interest of public safety. The next day, a startup known as Intramotev began testing its autonomous coal trains on the Cumberland Mine Railroad in Pennsylvania. I'm not really a fan of autonomous rail cars, but it is very interesting to see them as they're developed. The next day, CSX released its second heritage unit of the video, this time for the Western Maryland. Interestingly enough, for its first few days, it wore the logo of the Western Maryland Scenic Railroad, a modern-day tourist line in Cumberland, Maryland. This was soon fixed, however, and replaced with the actual WM logo. On the 5th, Canadian National announced that it would be acquiring and testing a Progress Rail dual hybrid locomotive capable of operating off both diesel and electricity from a battery. Just a few weeks later, this locomotive, an SD70H rebuilt from a Tier 4 SD70 ACE demonstrator, was spotted en route to Canada. On the 9th, Caltrain officially cut in the electricity on its brand new overhead catenary system between San Francisco and San Jose, California. This marks the final step in completing the Kalamata electrification project, 
and the railroad is expected to begin revenue runs of electric trains as early as September. On the 12th, the Massachusetts Bay Transportation Authority released an RFP or request for proposal for battery electric multiple units. These trains, if ordered, will eventually be used to turn the Fairmount line into a zero emissions rapid transit line. I sound like a broken record at this point, but battery electric trains are nowhere near as efficient, practical, or reliable as traditional electric trains, and they really don't make much sense, especially for rapid transit. On the same day, SEPTA terminated a long-delayed order with CRRC for bi-level commuter rail cars, stating poor build quality and delivery delays as the reason why they canceled it. If you're interested in learning more, check out this video I made about CRRC and its recent issues. The next day, while SEPTA was busy canceling an equipment order, California High Speed Rail was preparing to place one. On the 13th, the California High Speed Rail Authority finalized its official RFP for high-speed train designs, choosing Alstom and Siemens as its preferred manufacturers. The agency expects to award an official contract by the end of the year. On April 16th, CSX completed its first zero-emissions locomotive in collaboration with CPKC. This GP38, reclassified as a GP38H2, was converted to run off a hydrogen fuel cell and will most likely be used for switching and press events. On the same day, Amtrak put out an official request, not for a proposal, but just for information on zero emissions trains. In 2022, Amtrak committed to net zero greenhouse gases by 2045, and in order to get that done, they want to transition to what they call alternative power trains. This is once again probably just code for battery and hydrogen trains, but this could potentially result in some actual electrification as well. The next day, Dynamic Rail Preservation unveiled its recently repainted Amtrak F40PH. This engine has bounced around between various museums over the past decade, but currently resides at the Nevada State Railroad Museum. This new paint scheme shows not only what Amtrak's classic Phase 3 looked like when it was new, but also features vintage Operation Lifesaver logos on the nose and cab. March and April were big months for SEPTA. On the 19th, the Philadelphia commuter rail celebrated the 50th birthday of their Silverliner 4 cars, replacing certain SEPTA decals with those of predecessor railroads. So far, they've done the Reading, Penn Central, and Conrail, but apparently one more is on the way, most likely for the Pennsylvania Railroad. On the 22nd, in what may be the biggest railroad news story of 2024, Brightline broke ground on its Brightline West project, connecting Las Vegas to Greater Los Angeles with the country's first true high-speed rail. Brightline intends to complete this project in time for the 2028 LA Olympics, which would really be impressive considering how long California high-speed rail has been under construction for. If their 2028 deadline is met, it'll be one of the most efficiently built railroads in recent U.S. history. Two days later, on the 24th, Canadian Pacific Kansas City, still a terrible name for a railroad by the way, began its Golden Spike tour running its 2816 Empress steam locomotive from Calgary, Canada to Mexico City. Over the next month, 2816 would tour the CPKC system, and as of right now, it's in Mexico for the first time ever. On the 27th, the Berkshire Scenic Railroad restored and tested the experimental Roger Williams multiple unit from the 50s. This iconic streamliner, originally built for the New Haven, hasn't run in over 30 years, and it's great to see it under power again. On April 29th, Union Pacific's new ZTR battery electric locomotives were shown to the public for the first time. Operating as one battery electric locomotive and one traditional diesel, this hybrid duo will be tested in yard duty, where Union Pacific will determine whether battery electric is viable or not. As I've said a million times at this point, it's nowhere close to traditional electrification. On the same day, after undergoing a multi-month long cosmetic restoration, Norfolk Southern released its Lackawanna Heritage Unit from the paint booth at the Juniata Shops. They soon announced that 8102, the Pennsylvania Railroad unit, is on deck for the next repaint. Finally, on the same day, not wanting to be outdone by NS, CSX released its Pure Marquette Heritage unit. These CSX Heritage engines are certainly growing on me, but they can't hold a candle to Norfolk Southern's iconic heritage fleet, especially when they're freshly repainted. On May 1st, Brightline West unofficially announced that it'll be ordering Siemens American Pioneer high-speed trains. Their article has since been deleted, but if what it said was true, the new high-speed rail project will be buying these modern high-speed train sets capable of speeds of up to 220 miles per hour. Just over a week later, on the 8th, the Genesee in Wyoming painted an Alabama and Gulf Coast Railway Dash 9 into a veteran's paint scheme. The next day, it celebrated its 125th birthday with two heritage units wearing G&W's original paint scheme. On the 10th, the Washington Metro said goodbye to its last 40-year-old 2000 series trains. 
These old subway cars will soon be replaced by 8,000 series cars built by Hitachi. On the 13th, the first locomotive painted into the new CPKC paint scheme was completed and unveiled as part of the Golden Spike Tour in Kansas City. The first two CPKC locomotives are currently paired together in revenue service. Five days later, the first Amtrak Siemens Venture cab car was completed and delivered to the San Joaquins. This streamlined cab carries passengers while resembling the train's charger locomotive. Seven cab cars will be produced for the San Joaquin services over the next year or so and will allow for the retirement of aging F-40 NPCUs. On the 21st, Amtrak inaugurated a new service between Chicago and the Twin Cities known as the Borealis. This long-talked-about route extends west from the Hiawatha Corridor to St. Paul and Minneapolis. On the same day, CSX released yet another heritage unit, this time for the Seaboard Coastline. At the same time, a CSX GP38 was vandalized with a spot-on Louisville and Nashville paint scheme on the nose. This is the third time that this has happened in the last few months, and to be honest, some of these Jeeps look better than the official heritage units. Still on the 21st, Amtrak AEM-7 number 917 was saved from the scrapper's torch and moved from storage in Rhode Island to the Danbury Railway Museum in Connecticut. Finally on the 21st, the Aberdeen, Carolina, and Western Railway completed a one-of-a-kind bar locomotive. Known as Engine Room 87, this GEAC-60 was converted into a rolling bar that'll debut in June and later at the U.S. Open in Pinehurst, North Carolina. The next day, on the 22nd, the first recently acquired XCIT AC-44s were delivered to Wabtec to be rebuilt. Last year, Norfolk Southern purchased a handful of leaser AC-44 locomotives from CIT Rail, and after kicking around the system for a few months, they're being sent out to be rebuilt to the more standardized AC-44 C6M class. On the 26th of May, Via Rail retired its Renaissance cars. These were a rare instance of foreign equipment being used on a North American railroad as they were purchased from a cancelled British rail project in the 90s. Since then, they've become some of the most unique cars in Canada, but due to their European design and hardware, they've been replaced with modern Siemens Venture cars. Finally, on the 29th, the city of Charlotte, North Carolina reached an agreement with Norfolk Southern to buy their O-Line for commuter rail service between Charlotte and Mount Morne. Though it's just in planning right now, this could be one of the next commuter lines to pop up in the United States. And there you go, that's your recap of everything that happened in North American Railroad news over the last few months. Anyway, it's summer now, so that means I have time to make these videos more frequently, so for the months of June, July, and August, I'll be returning to monthly news videos in addition to hopefully uploading weekly. In August, when I go back to school, this series will return to quarterly status, but until then, thanks for watching, and I'll see you soon in another video.